Amen. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. For all that you're going to do for us. Yes. For all that you're going to do for us. Yes. 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 Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for everything. Jesus, my name. Hallelujah to your name. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Well, we are coming from Matthew chapter 13, verse 24 through 30. Amen. I am reading from the New King James Version, and it reads as follows. Another parable he put forth to them, saying, The kingdom of heaven is like a man who sowed good seed in his field. But while men slept, his enemy came and sowed tares among the wheat and went his way. But when the grain had sprouted and produced a crop, then the tares also appeared. So the servants of the owner came and said to him, Sir, did you not sow good seed in your field? How then does it have tares? He said to them, an enemy has done this. The servant said to him, do you want us then to go and gather them up? But he said, no, that's why you gather up the tares, you also uproot the wheat with them. Let it both grow together until the harvest. And at the time of harvest, I will say to the reapers, first gather together the tares and bind them in bundles to burn them but gather the wheat into my barn. Now, looking at this parable, <clears throat> of course your mind first goes to a farm and you see the farmer and you see the plow and you see all of that. But Jesus was talking about the kingdom of God. He was talking about the church. He was talking about how the enemy came in the devil. And we can see that all the way from the beginning, how he came in and he put his ways and his thoughts in the minds of man to, to change man's mind, to change him from wheat to tear. And so we can see here where he said he came on in and he sowed this into, into the body. And we can see that. We can see that where you can look at some places where the tears, the people who came in to destroy the work that was being done in in the lives of God's people coming in as though they might be wheat, but they're really tares. And you can see that in, in churches. And I'll use SMI as an example. And you can see with SMI, the SMI is the wheat. We are truly the wheat there. We are about loving God's people. We are about loving the enemy. We are about helping, giving the word of God, telling people about the love of Jesus Christ, and so that's what the wheat does. But then there was those that came in and because we're wheat, we help those. We help their ministries grow. We've helped them to, to uh, get closer to the Lord. And what they do, they left and they, they became the tear and they separated from the wheat because they really had tear in them. And it's about the heart. It's about where your heart is at. So we want to continue to be the wheat Letting our heart have the heart of flesh and not the not 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 the heart, you know, the hard heart, which God doesn't want us to have. And that's what the wheat does. The wheat has the heart of the flesh. The, the wheat has the mind of God, the mind of Christ. And so we can still see that they're still growing together, but we gotta remain the wheat because Jesus, who is our Lord and Savior, he's the appointed time. And so as the wheat, we're going to continue to see the tares grow. But what we have to do as the wheat, he said, so we don't be plucked up before our time is, how do we do that? We got to stay in the word of God. We got to keep coming to church. We got to keep praying. We got to keep encouraging each other. We got to stay connected to the true vine 
which is Jesus Christ. Amen, yeah. Elder? Yeah. Amen. Yes. 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 Amen. Can't hear you, Benny. Affirmation. All about Jesus. All about His commandments. All about His ways. All about His statutes. And live this life. This life. Before this, until He comes. Because He is the way for us. Mm. And as we can see, the tares are going to be burnt up. Yeah. And we're yeah. going to end up in the barn, which is the, the kingdom yeah. of God. So yeah. let's get in that. Let's stay in that barn. We in it. Let's stay in it. We got to continue to work while it's day. And we got to keep pressing towards the mark of the high calling in Christ Jesus until the very end. Amen. Let's yeah. do our weekly affirmation. Hallelujah. Amen. I'm mute your mics. Let's go. As disciples of the Lord. of Christ. Our mission is to be led by the empowering of the Spirit to empower others to life Jesus Christ and to proclaim God. We are to nurture and nurture others, equip others, all for the work of the ministry and for the edifying of the body of Christ. Through multiplication, edification, and transformation. Once we walk out of these doors, we will apply what we have learned to each of the time. As a form of worship towards God, so that he may receive glory from our God. Amen.
to everyone who have logged in this morning. Let us pray. Father, we're just so grateful for your love, your kindness, your power, your authority. Now, God, we ask that you are with us today during this teaching, God. We ask that you fall upon us fresh with fresh manner, God. Allow our spirit man to be open up and to receive what you have for us. We love you, Lord, and we bless you. And Yeshua Hashem, we pray, amen. Glory to God. Now, I want you to follow along so I PowerPoint my entire message so you can see what I'm saying. And so that uh, if you need to listen back to this, you'll have the points, you'll have the scripture, you'll be on point, and you'll be scriptural when you're studying this at a later time. Amen. To God be the glory. If you have your Bibles, then let us prepare our Bibles for Revelation. Chapter 3, verse 8. And the word of the Lord reads as follows. I know your works. See, I have set before you an open door, and no one can shut it, for you have a little strength, have kept my word, and have denied my name not. Now, in my intro introduction, I just want to share with you the Greek word for door is thora. And thora is portal or entrance or door or gate. But in Hebrew, it's delet. And it's the fourth aleph bet. That means you've got aleph, bet, gamma, delet. And it is the symbol of door. And it means opportunity or imprisonment. That means that you can have opportunity to do something, opportunity to gain something, or to imprison those things that you do not desire to have or to take place in your life. We are approaching the season of opportunity. That's the door. That's the portal we're approaching. And it is the opportunity for us to sow and seal, to sow and seal. So today's message is entitled Spiritual Preparation for Kingdom Doors. That's Spiritual Preparation for Kingdom Doors. The first thing I want to talk about is spiritual preparation. First and foremost, I need you to understand this. Revelation precedes authority. When revelation precedes authority, then it brings about manifestation. Now, you got to understand what I'm talking about. Revelation is enlightenment. Revelation is you having knowledge. And so in order for you to walk in the authority that God has called you to, you must understand, you must have revelation. You must know that you have this authority because revelation and authority brings about the manifestations that you need in your lives. Now, I want you to also understand prayer is our communication to God. But when we go into prayer, we go into covenant with God. And when we go into covenant with God, it is, it is a contractual agreement. That means we go into partnership with God. When we go into partnership with God, God is the silent partner and we are the active partner. That means that we are constantly doing and constantly speaking and constantly doing. God being the silent partner means that he has already released the resources that we need in the earth realm. And the only way that we're going to get that which we're having this conversation with God and going into meeting with him through his covenant for us, this co contractual agreement, we have to actively do something. We don't sit and say, God, will you give me a degree without applying for school? We got to actively do something. And so we are the active partner and he is the silent partner because he's already said and already done what he's already had set to say and do in the earth realm. In Matthew chapter six, verse eight, the Bible says, for your father knows the things. In fact, Jesus says this, 
your father knows the things that you are in need of before you ask. Now, God knows everything. He knows what you're in need of, but the contract says you ask and he will give. Are, are you with me? In James chapter four, verse two, it says, you lust and do not have, you murder and covet and cannot obtain, you fight and war, yet you do not have because you do not ask. Too often we're seeking the arm of flesh, we're seeking men, we're seeking people, we are, we'll fuss, cuss, and complain about what we don't have. Instead, all we have to do is ask our Heavenly Father because we have a covenant with Him. So why do you seek from man what only God can give you? That's a question. Why do we go to man? See, we will say, I've done everything I can. I've, I've done everything I know to do. Now, I, I, and then God is the last resort. Why is God the last resort? He should be your first resort. How do we know? Because Matthew chapter six, verse 33 says, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all of your provision shall be provided for you. So stop seeking man first, seek God first. Ask your heavenly father. He knows what you're in need of, but the contract says you are the active partner. And he is the silent partner. Just because he knows he's not going to bestow it upon you until you ask for it. So let's talk about spiritual preparation. Spiritual preparation can only come through knowledge. Remember I said knowledge, once you have that revelation, then you can operate, you can walk in the authority. Authority. So spiritual preparation can only come through knowledge of your authority in God and your authority with God. Remember, you are a partner with God. And so this partnership says you're not only you not only have authority in God, but you have the authority with God. You just don't have the equal authority that God has. Now, spiritual preparation relies on the revelation. That's why it's so important that you're learning your word, you're studying your word, you're, you're coming to teachings, you're, you're, you're actually uh, participating and studying prior. And then when you show up so that you'll have the knowledge, because that's where the authority comes from. And so part of that spiritual preparation and having that uh, that revelation and operating in your authority is part of our belief system. And it's an important for us to know and to realize that if your belief system says that you have great faith, then you're going to have great power. In your belief system, if you feel that you have small faith or little faith, then you're going to have little power. It all determines on your belief system, but it starts with the revelation. It starts with revelation brings forth manifestation because you operate in the authority because you have the knowledge. Revelation and spiritual authority brings forth manifestations, but not just ordinary manifestations. It brings forth the miraculous. So let's talk about the keys to the kingdom because we're talking about kingdom doors. And so we've got to start with, if you got kingdom doors, then you got to have kingdom keys. And so first off, I want to talk about the kingdom of God because not many people understand uh, what the kingdom of God encompasses. First and foremost, it encompasses heaven. Second, it encompasses earth. Then it includes the underworld. The underworld is death, the bottomless pit, and hell. That's the underworld, but that's still part of the kingdom of God. It also includes the lake of fire. The Bible tells us that we that, that in heaven, heaven can see the lake of fire. We can't see the lake of fire from earth. So that means it's part of the kingdom of God. And then, of course, the Garden of Eden, which is now paradise. And so uh, that's all part of the kingdom of God. So we have to understand what the kingdom of God includes. Now, still focusing on the keys of the kingdom. In Matthew chapter 16, verse 19, Yeshua says this, And I will give you the keys 
of the kingdom of heaven. I underline kingdom of heaven because he was specific, but we only see keys to the kingdom, but we don't see the specificity of it. It is the kingdom of heaven he gives us the keys to. So we don't have the keys to death. We don't have the keys to hell. We don't have the keys to the bottomless pit. We don't have the keys to Eden. We don't have those keys, but we do have the keys of the kingdom of heaven. And there are multiple keys because there are multiple doors to the kingdom of heaven. And he continues to say, and with whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. So we do not need keys to the earth because we have total access to the earth. That means we were created from the earth. We are a part of the earth. We will go back to the earth. So we have total access to the earth. Knowing the revelation about our relationship to the earth helps us understand our authority on the earth. We are legal residents. Remember, Yeshua, God could not come. He cannot enter into the earth hemisphere because he's not legally in a body and he had to come through a virgin through her womb in order to enter in and that's why we know him to be Emmanuel God with us he came in a in a physical body because he would have been illegal entering into the earth realm in Revelation chapter 1 verse 18 Yeshua says, I am he who lives and was dead and behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen. He said, do you not agree? Now, remember, uh, revelation comes from John the revelator. This is what he was seeing in a vision. And so uh, Yeshua comes to him and says, I was alive and, and, and I was dead and now I'm alive. And he says, do you agree with that? And, and, and the answer should have been from John. Amen. He says, I have the keys of Hades and death. Hades is hell, by the way. And Revelation 9 and 1, the Bible says, Then the fifth angel sounded, and I saw a star falling from heaven to the earth. And we're talking about an angel. To him was given the key to the bottomless pit. Now we know that there's an angel who has the key to the bottomless pit. So let's focus. We're, we're still talking about the keys to the kingdom, but there are principles that are tied into the king, the keys to the kingdom of heaven. And so we go into covenant with uh, Yeshua. Every believer goes into covenant with Yeshua. We have access to these keys, but there are principles that are tied into to these keys. And Matthew 18, verse 10, the Bible tells us again, I say to you, that if two of you agree on earth, this is a principle concerning anything that they ask, it will be done for them by my father in heaven. So we see the relationship that we have. Remember, we have the partnership with God. When we go into prayer, we go into partnership with God. God, we get God's attention. And because part of the kingdom principle says this, that when we come together as believers agreeing on something here on earth, remember, we are taking our keys. We're shaking the keys. Whatever we're asking for, it is bound on earth. Therefore, it's bound in heaven. And if, if it's loosed on earth, then it's loosed in heaven. And Matthew 18, verse 20, for where two or three are gathered together in my name, Yeshua says, I am there in the midst. And he can't help but being here in the midst because he dwells within us. So keys of the kingdom of heaven is our authority to open heavenly doors and close hell's gates. Now, Matthew chapter 16, verse 18 through 19 tells us that we have that kind of authority because Yeshua says the gates of hell shall not prevail on the fact that we have these keys. So we have the authority to open heavenly doors and close those hellified gates. Are you with me? 
Now let's talk about the kingdom portal because I've been talking about this kingdom portal and some of you are saying, I can't find anything on the internet about the kingdom portal. What is Dr. Yoli talking about? So I'm going to talk about it today. There's one portal with three Moadim. Moadim is the Hebrew word for appointed time. So Moad is only one appointed time. So this is plural. There are three Moadim, appointed times, but only one portal. In Revelation chapter four, verse one, the Bible says, after these things, I looked and behold a door, a portal standing open in heaven. It was an appointed time. John saw, he'd never seen this portal before, but he saw it in the vision. In Exodus 23, verse 14, the Bible says three times, and we'll be studying from Exodus 23. So if you want to have your Bibles out or you want to look at the projection, it's available for you. But in Exodus 23, verse 14, it says three times you shall keep a feast. How many times? Three times. One, two, three. Appointed time, Moedim. Three times you shall keep a feast to me in the year. He's commanding us to do this. This has not gone away. It is still in the earth realm. Verse 15, you shall keep the feast of unleavened bread. You shall eat unleavened bread seven days as I commanded you at the time appointed Moad in the month of Abib. Now, Abib doesn't exist anymore. It's now Nisan, which is the month of April. For in it, you came out of Egypt. None shall appear before me empty. That's why I keep saying during this appointed kingdom portal, when this portal is open, you sow a special seed because you are not to come before his presence empty. You must sow a special seed, whatever amount your heart is so led to do so. So this is during the time of Passover. Remember, on Resurrection Sunday, right now you are in your spiritual preparation for what is coming, the kingdom portal. You're in spiritual preparation where you are fasting. You have the sacrificial fast and vow. You have made a vow. You have taken your sheet. You have taken your sheet, you have filled in the top and the bottom, you have written the same exact thing. Reason why, it's a contract. You must have a copy. When you go into agreement or you make a vow or you make a, a, a covenant with God, you're gonna have two copies at least, one for yourself and one for God. We've got the commandments, the decalogues, and we have two copies. It has five or four on one side and, and five or six on another, what have you, but there are copies of them. So you've got the Ten Commandments on one stone and the Ten Commandments on the other. And there are four or six on, on the front, in the back, what have you. Verse 16 says, and the Feast of Harvest the first fruits of your labors, which you have sown in the field. Now, this is the time of Pentecost. This is Shavuot. So the portal is still, it remains from Passover to Pentecost. From Passover to Pentecost, the portal remains, but you're going to sow twice. You're going to sow during Passover. And that's why it's so important to, to, uh, to observe Passover because at the moment that you sit under the Passover table, God is ready to bless you. He says, I've got your attention. And that's why we strategically have Passover during Passover. And we give our tithes or our increase that, that special offering during Resurrection Sunday only when it falls during Passover. And so Shavuot or Pentecost is during June 4th through the 6th. And that's when we have our Holy Ghost on the move revival every year. We are being uh, intentional when we do that because this is the time where Holy Spirit comes and fills the church. And it is the birth of the church or the ecclesia. 
This is where uh, we uh, are no longer under the law, but now we're under grace and it and it's identifiable through Holy Spirit who's here to grace us. And then the scripture continues and says, and the feast of and gathering at the end of the year, when you have gathered in the fruit of your labors from the field. Now, there is three calendars. There's the biblical calendar in which we're seeing these times. And then there's the spiritual calendar, which is the creation of earth during September, October time. And then there's the Gregarian calendar calendar in which we're all uh, observing uh, the entire world actually observes by uh, today. And so we're talking about the time during Sukkot, which is the tent of tabernacles. And that's in the month of October through the 9th through the 16th this year. So he says three times in the year, all your males shall appear before the Lord. In other words, he says at least the head of the household should be the ones showing up. And but we know that even in the Bible, that women and children come if they're able to afford it. If they're not able to afford to go to Jerusalem during these times, biblically, they at least would save up and plan to go during Pentecost, uh, during Passover. So we're still talking about the kingdom portal. In Isaiah chapter 22, we see that there is the keys to the house of David. And it says, I will lay on his shoulder so he shall open and no one shall shut and he shall shut and no one shall open. In other words, there's somebody with some keys that have authority that we will never have access to. Only God can do it. When we're talking about the kingdom portal, we're connected to the eternal kingdom. When we're talking about the uh, eternal kingdom, we're talking about the Davidic covenant from Judaism to Christianity. That means that that tree, that olive tree, that tree of Israel, we are engrafted into that family as Christians. Every fruit, every different fruit. So that's, which, that's what makes this tree so unique. And then what makes it so unique is because we've got apples and we've got oranges and we got lemons. We've got all kinds of fruit that are, are that have been engrafted into this olive tree, which is Israel. So the key Revelation three and seven it repeats what is said in Isaiah twenty two twenty two, and to the angel of the ecclesia, the church in Philadelphia, which is brotherly love, write. These things says he who is holy, he who is true, he who has the key of David, he who opens and no one shuts and shuts and no one opens. We're talking about the eternal kingdom. Therefore, we must be talking about the king of kings, the eternal king, Yeshua. There are some doors that only God can open and there are some doors that only God can shut. In Isaiah chapter 45, verse one, the Bible says, this says the Lord to his anointed to Cyrus, whose right hand I have held to subdue nations before him and loose the armors of kings to open before him the double doors so that the gates will not be shut. I will go before you and make the crooked places straight. I will break in pieces the gates of bronze and cut the bars of iron. I will give you the treasures of darkness and hidden riches of secret places that you may know that I, the Lord, who called you by name, am the God of Israel. For Jacob, my servant's sake, and Israel, my elect, I have even called you by your name. I have named you though you have not known me. And so in other words, in Isaiah 45, we see that God will choose whomever he wants. He will anoint them. This Cyrus is a pagan king. God says, I anoint you and I will help you 
to bless Israel. And so God does the same thing for us. Only this is only what God can do. We're talking about this kingdom portal. This one portal. This is the portal that we want God's favor in because there are things that no man could ever do. But only God can do it. God can do it through whomever he wants, the least likely to whom for whomever he wants. And so there are some things that man just cannot do for you, no matter how much you try to strive for it, no matter how much money you think you can pay for it, no matter how much you try to pray for it, you've got to have that seed already sown in that portal because this is where the miraculous takes place. That's why there are people who are doing extraordinary things because they know the seasons in which that portal opens. And even if they don't, even they do it by happenstance. It is a promise that God makes that there are some things that you just can't do that only God can do. He can open and shut doors that you could never do on your own. In 2 Corinthians 2, 12, the Bible tells us furthermore, and we're talking about the apostle Paul. He says, I came to true ass to preach Christ's gospel and a door was opened to me by the Lord. There are doors that only God can open. But then there are doors that are open. Not every one of us are, are, are supposed to walk through. We're not free to walk through. We may see a door and think that, oh, God opened the door, but not necessarily true. Because 1 Corinthians 16 and 9 says, for a great and effective door has opened to me and there are many adversaries. In other words, this door was open but there was the flesh, there was the, the devil, there was uh, things that you may have asked for and you were seeking after, but it starts pulling you away from God, starts pulling you away from your family and your relationships. You, you start tiptoeing out on your spouse, you start neglecting your children. And so those are the doors that you have to have discernment for because not every door that is open is from God. So a portal of sowing is an opportunity to receive from God's people. Now, you're probably saying, well, I give my tithes and offering, and that's good. That takes care of the provision. That means that you're going to be able to continue to pay your mortgage and to pay your car notes and to put food on the table and to buy clothes. It takes care of the provision. You're giving a tenth of all that you earn. It takes care of the provision. But we're talking about that increase, the, the miraculous things that we could not possibly do just by giving a tenth. But it's things that when we sow uh, above our tithes, so look, this is how it works. And, and, and we've, we've studied Malachi, Malachi and, and, um, and Genesis and, and sowing the seed and so get the seed in the ground. It sends a signal to heaven. But what I'm talking about is that if you do not give your tenth, your offering is, it doesn't mean anything. So you have to give the 10th first and then give an offering. And the offering, and the offering is the increase. However, during the appointed time, the Moadim, during that time, if you are conscious of it and you sow all of your tithes plus a dollar, that now that includes you into the time of the miraculous. You understand? So to sow and seal, to sow above the tide, we celebrate before his presence during this time. And, and see, that's how you know the difference between God and flesh. Because Christmas is, is although people say, well, we're celebrating the birth of, of Jesus, uh, uh, but he's no longer a baby. And so now it's all about you and your family and your kids and lying to the kids about Santa Claus and giving them gifts that they don't deserve. They haven't even earned it. Uh, you, you, you tell them that they better behave themselves or Santa Claus ain't going to get them something. But what about telling them that if you don't obey God's word and, and obey, obey my rules, you're not going to get anything. And so, so I say all that, you can tell the difference because you, during the times that, that God says, these are the times that you come before my presence, those are the times that we are celebrating him. 
that it's all about him and what he has done for us. It's a time of feast and not a time of fasting, not a time of famine. It is a time to eat till you pop. It is a time to lavish the Lord with adornments and telling him how wonderful he is, to praise him, to worship him, to magnify him, to bring gifts, to increase the church, to, to, to come in and clean the church out and, and then buy new chairs and, and buy new equipment for the church house. It is a time to lavish on the Lord. It is time to bless him. So doors of distribution happens during personal Moedim times of need. And there are different doors, but God is the one who comes in and opens those doors or closes those doors. And so those are the times of distribution. It is not a set time. So it's not a time that you know about. It's a time down the road, down the way, sometime. You, look, you're working and you're making money and you're paying your bills, but then all of a sudden sickness hits your house or a child is put in jail or something happens that you have no idea about, but God has already provided for that provision because you have already sown a miraculous seed and you've shaken your head and you're scratching your head and saying, only God can do that. So let's talk about the portal of nine blessings. Now, you probably heard me say seven blessings. Well, I did a deeper study and came up with nine blessings. I said, Lord, I, I like the number seven because it represents completeness. But God, I found nine blessings in the area where you told me to search. And so I searched in this area and I found nine blessings and nine represents new beginnings. It also represents that restoration and, and, and new births. So in Exodus 23, and we're going to study from there and then we'll head on out. We'll close out. Exodus 23, verse 20. It says, behold, I send an angel before you to keep you in the way and to bring you into the place which I've prepared. Now, naturally, if he's talking about an angel, many of us just start to turn to the prophet, the priest, the teacher, the pastor. The, the Hebrew word for angel is malak, and it means messenger, ambassador, or representative. But spiritually, when we're looking at that word angel, it is a created being made from God's purpose or made for God's purpose. So he created angels. They cannot procreate. Therefore, they're not like humans. They can't reproduce. We can reproduce because God made us. He created us with a seed, but he did not create angels with a seed. And so therefore, they are created beings to only create it for God's bidding. And so when they um, rebel against God, they are cast into the bottomless pit. That is the prison for wayward angels. And we, the Bible talks about how there's going to be a time when that door, the key to that door is going to be open and a third of humanity is going to be destroyed by these wayward angels. They're there, they're bound up, they're there. So when we're talking about the angels and he says angels, angels were created out of light, but not sunlight. They were created out of, the, out of the light that create light to name. And so that's the same light that the angels are made of. So we can safely say that they're electrifying. The Bible says in Ezekiel 1 verse 13, as for the likeness of the living creatures, their appearance was like burning coals of fire, like the appearance of torches going back and forth among the living creatures. The fire was bright and out of the fire was lightning. In Matthew chapter 28, verse two, Yeshua says, and behold, there was a great earthquake for an angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone from the door and sat on it. His countenance was like lightning and his raiment white as snow, as, as Matthew written. 
And Luke chapter 10, verse 18, Yeshua says, and he said to them, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. And so Bible tells us in Psalms 91, the purpose, the bidding that they must do for God. It says in Psalms 91, 11, for he shall give his angels charge over you to keep you in all of your ways. And then Satan's going to quote this scripture to Yeshua while he's fasting and said, but you can throw yourself down from the pentacle of this place. He says, because God has given you, your father has given you charge, given angels charge over you so that you will not dash your foot. And he says, and Jesus says, we don't test the Lord thy God. So our first blessing is Jehovah Shama, the Lord is present because he said that I will, I will send a representative who will be with you to keep you in all of your ways, to protect you, to, to have the very presence of God. And these are the angels who stay in the presence of God. The more they stay in the presence of God, the stronger they are. And that is a sign for us. The more that we stay in God's word, the more that we stay around brothers and sisters of faith, the more that we are in the presence of God, the stronger we become. Back at Exodus chapter 23, verse 22. But if you indeed obey his voice and do all that I speak, then I will be an enemy to your enemies and an adversary to your adversary. In other words, God is going to give you protection by positioning you and aligning you to his word and his power and his way. He's going to give you divine protection. Blessing number two, Jehovah Rohai, the Lord our shepherd. In Exodus 23, verse 24, you shall not bow down to their gods, nor serve them, nor do according to their works, but you shall utterly overthrow them and completely break down their sacred pillars. In other words, he will rise you up in spiritual authority where you'll be cutting and smashing those things that do not align themselves with God's word. You will enter into a place and people will just know that there is some type of, you are someone of a Authority, you will show up and people start hiding beer and, and hiding wine and, 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 and trying to hide the cards and, and trying to hide stuff so that you couldn't see. They try to, to correct themselves and, and try not to, to, to use the profanity around you and, and start throwing their cigarettes away. So this is blessing number three, Yehovah Tikanu, the Lord, our righteousness. Exodus 23, verse 25. So you shall seek the Lord your God and he will bless your bread and your water. Now, this isn't like us blessing our food and our water. We go and we bless, we do grace. It's different. This is kingdom prosperity. When God blesses what he is giving you when he blesses your bread and your water. This is the kind of miracles that builds wells in Africa, that feeds thousands of people, that changes uh, the hearts of people in prisons. You, you have kingdom prosperity that reaches beyond just you trying to pray for your meal. It goes beyond the doors of what humans can do. This is miraculous stuff. This is kingdom prosperity that God blesses. And then it continues to say, oops. It continues to say, and I will take sickness away from the midst of you. And this is supernatural health where some people die of cancer, but God supernaturally heals you of the cancer. Uh, the, there are people who have died from COVID, but then there are that supernatural help. And, and it doesn't mean that they didn't love God as much as you love God, but he protects you because you have sown in the appointed time. And so whatever you're in need of that man cannot do, God does. And so blessing number four, he becomes Jehovah Jireh, the Lord who provides. 
And then blessing number five, he's Jehovah Rapha, the Lord, our healer. And then Exodus 23, verse 26, no one, no one shall suffer miscarriage or be barren in your land. I will fulfill the number of your days. In other words, he will grant you long life, not only just long life, but strong life. So blessing number six, Jehovah Shekanu, which means the Lord who has given us life he sustain us so that we may see celebrations. And then Exodus 23, verse 27. I will send. Believe it or not, I cannot see the scripture. Can I get someone to open your mic and read this? I will send my fear before you. I will cause confusion among all the people to whom you come and will make all your enemies turn their back to you. Amen. In other words, so this is what God does for us. He releases fear and respect from our enemies. So this is blessing number seven. He becomes Jehovah Nisi, the Lord, our banner. That means that a banner is something that goes before an army that makes a declaration to the enemies. And so God says he will send fear among those who are your enemies to confuse them so much so that they'll respect you. And verse 20 in Exodus 23, verse 30, little by little, he will drive them out from before you until you have increased and you inherit the land. So he guarantees us inheritance. He guarantees us assets and he guarantees us prop property. And we're not talking when we get to heaven. We're talking about right here on earth. When this portal is open and you participate, whatever the seed that you put in it, it's a guarantee that God will do these things for you, miraculous things for you. So blessing number eight, Jehovah Shalom, the Lord, our peace. Now, peace doesn't mean not having, not being in war with a nation, but in English, peace means the absence of conflict. But in Hebrew, it means to make it good, uh, shall surely pay, shall make full restoration, shall restore or to make something whole. And so this is what God does for us. He does that shalom for us, total, uh, total uh, completeness, total. That's where uh, uh, buildings are given to you and and land is, is given to you. You you inherit things that you are not entitled to. You have access to things that you, you're not entitled to. God opens these doors that you could never open with your money. That, that these are things that don't even require money. God does for you. In Exodus 23, verse 31, and I will set, and I will set your bounds from the Red Sea to the Sea of Philistia and from the desert to the river, for I will deliver the inhabitants of the land into your hand and you shall drive them out before you. He will expand your territory he will give you a Jabez blessing. And so blessing number nine, he becomes El Shaddai, all sufficient one, where he expands the land. He expands your territory. So as I close out, I just want to remind you that there is a kingdom, kingdom portal of blessings there's a time that it'll be open and that begins on April 15th. That is during Passover. 
that it's the opportunity for us to sow and seal. That's why we're going to bring our vow, that which we have committed on this paper. We're going to bring our vow. We're going to sow it uh, on that day. We're going to end our sacrificial fast and vow on Palm Sunday. We're going to celebrate our way uh, to Passover. We're going to bring our seed. And we have the three times in the year where we do it. Passover, Pentecost, remember Pentecost, we're going to sow a seed for a day. So that means for 50 days, whatever we're sowing, it equals to the amount of 50, whether it's 50 cents or $50,000. And then the nine blessings, the first, the blessing number one, Yehovah Shammah, being in the presence of God gives you strength and power. Blessing number two, Yehovah Rohai, he is the shepherd. He's the one who brings you by still waters and green pastures. Blessings number three, Yehovah Tikkunu, he's the Lord our righteousness. And because he's the Lord our righteousness, he makes us righteous. And blessing number four, Yehovah Jireh, the Lord who provides extraordinarily. Blessing number five, Yehovah Rapha, the Lord our healer. Blessing number six, Yehovah Shekanu the Lord our who has given us life, who sustains our life so that we may see times of celebration. Blessing number seven, Yehovah Nisi, the Lord our banner who goes before us. Blessing number eight, Yehovah Shalom, the Lord our peace. And finally, blessing number nine, El Shaddai, our all-sufficient.